Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Drawing from History. I'm just going to mute you all. How's it all going? Is everyone doing okay? Well, I can't mute you and then ask you that question. So let me, yeah. So uh, I hope you're all doing an absolutely, having an absolutely fantastic day and that you're ready for two hours in the workshop and uh, ready to explore the amazing artwork of Sir Peter Paul Rubens, who's one of the most important artists of the first half of the 17th century and quite possibly one of the most influential painters of the entire early modern period, okay? Certainly one of the most influential painters of the post-Renaissance era of early modernity. And uh, yeah, so while people are joining, I'm going to give a little introduction before we get into the uh, workshop proper, so to speak. All right, so everyone, thank you very much for joining. All right, so what I ought to do is just say a few words of introduction about Rubens. And it's kind of unusual for us in our community to be looking at Rubens as the sole source or the sole or primary or central artist of focus, because while he's been mentioned many times as a point of reference, you know, Rubens is an incredibly important artist and we all know that, but he's never featured as the, as the main subject, okay, of any of these Drawing From History workshops. Right from the beginning, we've been doing these since 2000 and since uh, March, March 2020. It's now May 2022, and this is the first drawing from history workshop on Sir Peter Paul Rubens. Okay, so it's uh, a new. It's quite exciting because it's a new artist, and his background is significantly different to all of the other artists that we've looked at, and also. Well, we have looked at some artists from the 17th century, and we've just finished a series on Sir Anthony Van Dyke. We've also looked at Rembrandt quite extensively. We've also looked at Caravaggio quite extensively in a number of workshops going back to the very early, early days of the Drawing from History workshops online. We've been looking at Rembrandt and Caravaggio. But now um, we're looking at another artist of this period who is a post-Renaissance artist, and he has a different background to all of them and he has a far more wide wide he has a far wider impact during his lifetime and his work is spread far and wide across europe and he unlike artists who do have a massively important impact such as caravaggio and rembrandt he executes paintings for elites across the whole of the continent, including England, including Britain. So he works in Italy, in Spain, in Flanders, of course, and in England and Germany. He's born in Germany, um, although he uh, doesn't he, he doesn't receive his artistic training or, or execute any of his main commissions there, but he is influenced by German art, okay, as we will discover today. So, uh, okay, so that's a very, very brief uh, cursive uh, introduction to the workshop, and I'm now going to give a proper introduction to Rubens while all of you are drawing from the first slide today. And here we've got a very early painting by Sir Peter Paul Rubens. It's a portrait of a man, either an architect or a mathematician. Um, he's a young man who is here being depicted by Sir Peter Rubens in around 1597. Well, in fact, it is 1597 because we do have, uh, this is the earliest, one of the earliest dated works that we have from Rubens um, while he's still in his first Antwerp period. Just like with uh, Van Dyck, who we looked at in the last series, Rubens is from Antwerp and he has a first Antwerp period and then goes to Italy. This is very similar to, to, to Van Dyck because Van Dyck has his first Antwerp period. He develops his approach, he receives his training, but then he comes of age and develops his own style 
or, or, or develops a, a new style um, in Italy upon seeing a range of other artworks. Now, Rubens had a really, really interesting education. It was an interdisciplinary education because the painters that trained him, especially his main teacher, had a, a very scholarly approach to painting as a genre painter. But Van, about, sorry, not Van Dyck. I'm so used to talking about Sir Anthony Van Dyck that his name may be spoken mistakenly at times. So forgive me if that happens again. With Rubens, he's not only trained as a painter, you see, um, he receives a humanistic education as a, as, a, as a boy up until the age of 13, which is a similarity with Michelangelo. So Michelangelo is given an, an, a literary education before he becomes an apprentice to Domenico Ghirlandaio in the, 14, um, in the 1480s. And uh, Rubens is first given a literary education uh, during the opening years of the 1590s. He enters uh, the workshops of artists to be trained from around 14, uh, from around 14, between 14, for, between 1590 and 1594. And uh, so in the late 16th century. So here we've got a uh, portrait of a, a man, either a, an architect or a geographer. We have a couple of tools um, that might give us an indication of what he, he does. And we'd also have a timepiece, which is quite symbolic, but we'll talk about that later, because what we're going to do is focus on the main portrait first, and then we'll focus on the face. Okay, so this is a chance for you to sketch the whole thing in. The next slide will be a close up of the face and the rough, and then the following one will be a close up of the hands. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing to start with. All right, so I'll give you 15 minutes or maybe 10 to 15 minutes to, to work on the whole thing before we do a close up on the face. And what we're going to do now is just to give a, a broad kind of introduction, really, to, to Rubens, who is. Um, well, he has been mentioned before and touched upon a number of times at Drawing From History over the last two or so years. He's never been the central focus of a workshop. And now we are starting a series, a three part series on Spiritual Rubens. This series is entitled Dynamic Eclecticism. Spiritual Rubens, Dynamic Eclecticism. And the reason it's called that is, some, is because of something I've already touched upon. Rubens didn't only have an artistic training. He also had a literary education and liter a literary education in the late 15th century was a sort of late or post Renaissance humanistic education where Rubens would have learned about the classics. He would have learned Latin would have been really, really important. Grammar, rhetoric, he would have learned a lot about main authors of Greek and Roman antiquity, including Homer, who was the great Greek poet, and Homer is Homer alongside Hesiod are the two earliest literary sources for the development of the Western imagination. Okay, in in Greco antiquity, in Greek antiquity. So he would have become acquainted with these texts and the narratives comprised within them. He would have become versed with philosophy, with some philosophers. He would have been, he would have understood who some of the humanistic philosophers were, such as Machiavelli. He would have learned about the great Roman authors like Cicero, like Virgil. And he would have also become given a strong education in pagan mythology. So Hellenic, um, Hellenic um, mythology. He would have also learned about a different type of literary culture, which was the Judeo-Christian one. So he would have known about the Old Testament and the New Testament. He was also a Catholic, and so he his work at that point, something we mentioned in the previous workshop, that these uh, artists from Flanders 
like Van Dyck and Rubens, were active within the context of the Catholic Reformation, which was the papacy's response um, to the papacy's response to the Protestant Reformation, which kicked off in, which really kicked off in 1517, so earlier on in the century in which Rubens was born. So there's a bit of context. Now I'm going to go back to my notes before I go too far into one topic that catches my attention. So as I mentioned at the very start, Rubens is one of the most influential artists of the entire 17th century and one of the great painters of post-Renaissance Europe. In post-Renaissance Europe, we're still in the early modern period because the early modern period spans from the dawn of the, uh, well, the eclipse of the Middle Ages, okay, the twilight of the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, all the way up, up until the French Revolution. And then we get the dawn of the modern age. So while Rubens is post-Renaissance, he's still very much within the early modern period. And by the late 16th century, by the 16th, 50s even you could argue that the renaissance proper as as really as 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 is really quite over by then so rubens is part of the post renaissance world and he is one of the main artists of the early baroque period okay so what he does in his career is bring the different top topics or types of painting, so portraiture being one, history painting being another, landscape being another type of painting, he brings these types of painting into a new age, especially genre painting. Genre painting is regarded or was regarded at this time as the most elite form that painting could take, because not only did it comprise figures in narrative with you know elements of architecture landscape but it also had that connection to a theoretical or literary current of idea current of ideas so uh, a history painting could be something like um samson and delilah which we looked at in the first episode on on Van Dyck, that's a genre painting because it it tells a narrative um, with numerous figures and it puts them together in a way that may that visually telegraphs a theological story from the Old Testament. And the genre painting could also be something that would could relate to the history of a of a nation, so a military victory, for example, um, or it could relate to a mythological scene. And so genre painting isn't portraiture where it's just an individual or two or three individuals being painted to preserve or, or manifest the identities, the identity or identities of those depicted. And it isn't a landscape which depicts uh, a, a, you know, an expanse of space outside. The genre painting is something that has a narrative which includes a number of figures and has a specific sort of literary meaning. The genre painting uh, in Rubens's time and before Rubens and of, as well as after Rubens was regarded as the, the, the most erudite form of painting and, and the great genre painters were perceived to be um, higher than the portraitists and the still life painters and the landscape painters within the hierarchy of painting. So still life painting was considered a very, very basic form of painting, which didn't require the level of skill, erudition, knowledge, and um, communicative talent as, uh, as genre painting. Above still life, you had the landscape painters, and above the landscape painters, you had the portraitists. Portraitists were considered a notch above um, landscapes, landscape painters and still life painters because they could conjure a sense of individuality, of individual identity, and also mood. And also the figure is a more challenging subject or was perceived to have been a more challenging subject. 
um, than still life or, or landscape. Now, genre painting comprises all of those types of painting or types of or approaches to painting and puts them all into one picture plane in a in a way which makes coherent sense within a composition and also tells a story which draws upon classical learning or historical understanding and to create a narrative through the image and that's why genre painting is the elite kind of painting it's the most uh, worthy and it's what distinguishes the great painters from the not so great painters or the painters of the very first highest rank to those uh, below them within the hierarchy of artists. So genre painting is something that Rubens really transforms in his career and he brings such a range of influences into his uh, genre paintings and that's what he's most widely known and appreciated for is his genre painting we're starting with this little portrait because it's a great way to talk about his training and to talk about the development that he had in antwerp um, as an as a as a someone who le is learning to paint and becoming an independent artist before he then goes to italy so he he, he brings this new approach or this new vision of genre painting. He changes the, he, he really, really does redefine genre painting in his career, okay? And he does that through a very, very dynamic and interdisciplinary approach in combining classical erudition, travel. He draws from Renaissance art, and classical art across Europe through his travels. He draws from classical art and Renaissance art through prints and surviving drawings. He draws from classical and Renaissance sculpture. He also draws from literature. Okay, so his classical education, which I already mentioned, that doesn't only uh, consist in classical Greek and Roman literature, but also in Christian Christian letters in the Bible, in the New and Old Testament, and the Church Fathers. He also doesn't only draw from those, but also draws from contemporary art of his own time. Now, Rubens is born in 1577. Caravaggio was just born six years earlier. So while in our minds, in our imagination, Caravaggio belongs to a different era, you know, in my imagination, at least. In my imagination, there is a very, very important relationship between Caravaggio and Rubens, but they are, they seem to me to be worlds apart. I mean, th there's no artist tied up in the Catholic Reformation to the same extent as, as Caravaggio was. He was the image maker for the, for the Catholic Reformation to a far greater degree than Rubens ever was. But it's very useful to uh, understand or to acknowledge or to become sensitive to the fact that the time of Caravaggio overlaps with the time of Rubens. They're from very different places, but yet they're both within the fold or within the sphere of Catholic Europe during the time of the Catholic Reformation, which, as I mentioned, was a response or a reaction to the Protestant Reformation, which divided Europe between Protestant and Catholic in the early 16th century, during the late Renaissance, or the High Renaissance, really, during the High Renaissance. So that's, that's, that's important. He, he also draws from contemporary artists, and that's why I mentioned Caravaggio there, is because when, when, when Rubens is in Rome as a young man, he leaves he leaves Flanders in 1600 for Rome. And when he's in Rome, Caravaggio is there. And Caravaggio has, has been there and he's left a very, very big impression. Rubens sees the St. Matthew triptych. Well, not it's not a triptych. There are three huge paintings in the Chiesa of um, Chiesa dei San Luigi dei Francesi the church of Louis the French in, in, in Rome. And um, I mean, 
they make a big impression on on on, on Rubens. So he's an artist, and that's this is why I'm calling this this series on Rubens dynamic eclecticism. It's because Rubens is an artist who's able to bring all of these different strands of thought and influence together, and in doing so, conjures an entirely new pictorial vision for genre painting, the most elite form of painting. Okay, so he drew from everything he saw, which inspired him. That could be a life model. That could be himself in the mirror, someone he loves. It could, it could be a painting by Caravaggio, a painting by Titian even. He drew from Titian. He drew from a very, very wide range of classical Greek and Roman sculpture, from the Farnese Hercules to the Belvedere Torso, to the Laocoon, to the Dying Gaul, to the wrestlers, those two wrestlers who are engaged in gladiatorial wrestling, maybe not gladiatorial wrestling, maybe Olympic wrestling, or just practice, perhaps. Okay, so he drew from all of those. Um, he drew from Renaissance drawing as well. He worked from Leonardo's cartoon for the Battle of um, Anghiari, which was on display at the uh, Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. He drew from Michelangelo's um, very, very early sculpture, which Michelangelo had done as a young boy in the Garden of St. Mark's when under the guidance of, uh, under the guidance of sculpture under um, oh, Bertoldo de Giovanni, who was the sort of uh, sculpture teacher for Lorenzo the Magnificent in the 1490s. So he drew from that beautiful sculpture and there's, that drawing exists, Rubens' drawings of, of Rubens' drawing of Michelangelo's uh, lap, uh, Battle of the Lapiths still exists, we have that drawing. So he drew from everything, he drew from, he drew from, everything he saw that he found inspiring. And he was, he had a, 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 his creative appetite was insatiable. And he was a genius. There's no doubting in my mind that Rubens, while he's not one of my favorite painters, okay, I'll admit that, he is an artist I regard to be a truly great painter and an eclectic genius someone who is able to grapple numerous different strands of thought, intellectual thought, literary thought, aesthetic ideas in many different forms, such as painting, sculpture, drawing, from life as well, and put them all together into a, into a, a visual language which he owns. So he's kind of an ultimate form of, of the artist, in my, in my estimation. So the humanistic education is very important. It's quite significant. Um, and what his humanistic literary education does is it leaves a, a literary current running through the movement of his figures and the compositions of his paintings. He becomes the leading painter in Antwerp as a young man, and he would become the dominant painter in all of Europe and would be the dominant painter in all of Europe until 1640 when he dies. He's one of the great painters of the last of, last of the great eras of painting. He brings together key developments into an approach which could neither be matched nor surpassed. I'm reading from my notes now. It could never be matched or surpassed in subsequent centuries unless by a rupture or shift in values. And what I mean by that in my notes is that you could only surpass the great painters of this era, the 17th century, which is, in my opinion, the last era of great painters. You know, after Velazquez dies, there aren't, you know, in the 18th century, there aren't any really painters anywhere near the league of artists like Rubens and Velasquez or Rembrandt. In the 19th century, there are none. There are no painters that can compare to the old masters. You know, the old masters is a, the, 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 the culture, the traditions and the aesthetic of the old masters. It lasts from the Renaissance 
up until the great painters of the 17th century. And after that, there are no old masters anymore. That's the end of the old master tradition. And they're never matched or surpassed. Every period of, of painting after the old masters derives or attempts to derive its value from the old masters. Even, even artists like Picasso, they are obsessed with the old masters and, and they carry around this burden of insecurity that they, are, they, that they could never match the old masters. And that is something that is demonstrated by Picasso time and again, when he relentlessly copies Velazquez. And with Manet, one of the good painters of the 19th century, you know, he marvels at the old masters. They're never surpassed and they're never matched unless I wrote by rupture or a change in values. So in order to surpass or to match the old masters, you have to have a paradigm shift culturally, or, or there has to be a kind of social upheaval, a rupture with the past in which it's possible to lay the foundations of a new set of aesthetic and intellectual values, which become the prism through which uh, art, the quality of art is evaluated. So, and, you know, that's not really entirely happened. And so the old masters will remain the last, you know, these, the artists of this era, the mid to mid, you know, the early 17th century to the mid 17th century to the, to Velasquez who dies in the, in 14, six, in 1560, you know, these are the, these are the, these are the, these are the last of the greats. Okay, well, some of us may like painters from later years that they're, they're the old that the old masters are the, the greatest. And that's not just me being uh, making a tendentious claim. That's something that um, actual painters today admit. I mean, a contemporary painter like John Curran um, in New York, who's a contemporary painter working in New York, who's uh, quite an excellent artist. Um, will acknowledge that and will acknowledge that about um, the, the unsurpassable um, genius of, of, of Diego Velasquez. So, uh, yeah, so shift in values. And it's historic, this is historical European painting. Historical re European painting has its zenith or its culmination in the 17th century. That's my opinion. It shouldn't really be about my opinion, but um, you know we're doing history here, and history is only really done properly when it's free of bias and free of ideology. Okay, so but so but I admit that's my opinion. As long as I state that, and and that's not not something that I expect you to 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 just take without questioning. Okay, so um, this great canon of painters really ends in the, in the 17th century. Nothing lay, later matches what the old masters were, the old masters of early modern Europe. Now, what, 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 what really defines the old masters and what really, uh, how can we categorize them or how can we understand the significance of, of, of Rubens better, how we can understand the significance of Rubens better through uh, knowing what it is what are the historical developments of paintings that led up to him, so to speak? Okay, so what are the developments in the history of painting that Rubens is consciously aware of, which um, influence the development of his own application of paint and his own um, his own ability to create paintings in terms of their design and composition? Okay, so what I'm going to do is move the slide. I want you all to focus on the face now. So I've made that slightly bigger and we'll do, you know, you can either work on the drawing you're already doing or do a new drawing and focus just on the face. Okay, and the next slide is going to be the hands. Okay, so with the, the development of painting that Rubens is really, really aware of is it begins, you know, the old masters really begins with painters like Chimabue and Giotto in the 13th and 14th centuries. You know, Giotto is active in the, you know, the latter years of the, the Dugento, the 1200s, and he's active in the early years of the 1300s. 
these two painters introduce and we've done we've done Giotto before a year or so ago in drawing from history but what what Chimabwe and Giotto do is introduce a greater sense of intimacy in the relationships between the figures in their paintings and they also attempt to show a greater three-dimensionality in their in their scenery with the architecture in the scenery and in the objects that they depict such as chairs and thrones and various other things um, but they do so without a formula for linear perspective which is what keeps them locked in that medieval aesthetic um, later generations which include artists like Masaccio, Piero della Francesca and Fra Filippo Lippi these are the first artists to use linear perspective linear perspective was discovered and robustly outlined by Filippo Brunelleschi in the opening years of the 1400s in the maybe in the latter years of the 1300s because it was in use by 1400 by artists there's the artists like Lorenzo Ghiberti and uh, Donatello, Masaccio, Fra Filippo Lippi these were all artists that were using linear perspective in the early 1400s this is all something very very important when defining what we mean by old masters and had a very very important impact on Rubens and we can't really understand Rubens's significance without perceiving his relationship to the older old masters or the earlier old masters and how he brought about such a change in the appreciation of genre painting the later key development in the history of painting came with the generation of the Paleolo brothers also Andrea del Verrocchio in Florence because they're the artists who really started to emphasize anatomy and three-dimensionality in the figurative design so the drawing on paper the design on paper started to be more uh, three-dimensional and the use of tone in the drawing to model the form was um, used to greater to a greater more dynamic and, and and also more subtle effect by especially by Verrocchio which made a huge impression on Leonardo and the generation of artists who followed Verrocchio you know and that generation comprised artists like Perugino like Ghirlandaio like Lorenzo de Credi and Leonardo da Vinci Leonardo's it, you know Leonardo impacted painting and drawing hugely you can't overstate the impact that Leonardo had on the expressions of the faces capturing the physiology of the of, of emotion as expressed in the human face also um, Leonardo had a huge impact on the development of the subtle modeling of the face and the landscape in oil painting across Europe Michelangelo you know very well the impact that he had with his figurative works and the the way that the figure was so dynamic in Michelangelo's paintings and so monumental and on the paint the, the figures in Michelangelo's painting also telegraph within themselves a kind of theological purpose um, and the ideal beauty of the human form so Michelangelo is in, immensely influential on the development of painting. After painters like Michelangelo, we have the Mannerists like Pontormo, Andrea del Sarto, um, Piero di Cosmo. No, Piero di Cosmo is about um, is is it's influenced certainly influenced by Michelangelo, but he doesn't have such a huge he doesn't have such a huge influence himself. But other great Mannerists like Rosso Fiorentino, these have a really big impact, and also have a really big impact on Flemish painting. Which is which has a really really important influence on Sir Peter Paul Rubens, uh -huh. and then alongside uh, the Florentines, my discussion so far has been quite Florentine in uh, complexion. We also have to involve the Venetian painters that had a really really massive influence on painting. So T Giorgione, with his with his more poetic approach, which was influenced by uh, Mantegna and Giovanni Bellini. Okay, so Bellini and Mantegna had a big impact and they actually influenced Leonardo as well. So we have uh, Giorgione in Venice, Titian in Venice, Tintoretto later on in Venice, 
and then we have Caravaggio. So what I've just spoken about in those sort of figures that I've mentioned, these painters hold within their own work the primary developments that transformed painting from the late Middle Ages up until the time of Rubens. Rubens is aware of all of this through his travels, through his erudition and through his understanding of the history of art. And Rubens brings all of these together in a, in a, in a very, very sophisticated way. And the influences and the primary things about the history of painting, he brings them together in a very sophisticated way. And where does painting have left to go after that? That's what causes the decline, you know, that they these develop you know what else is there to do and i think that you know that is why painting really de declined in the 18th century you know look at the, the 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 sheer volume of paintings of such high quality of such aesthetic quality of such the quality of the materials and the quality of how they were executed in the 17th century it's never been matched and, and the, the volume of paintings, you know, the amount of paintings produced in just in the Netherlands in the 17th century compared to the 18th century, it was a real craze for, for, for the painted image in the 17th century in the Netherlands. And, you know, where are the great painters after the 17th century? It's, it's the last great era of painting. And I think it's because painters like Velasquez, painters like Van Dyck, painters like Rubens, painters... Uh, like El Greco, painters like Caravaggio, painters like Franz Hals and Rembrandt. They didn't really leave much else to be done. They all drew upon the developments that I'd mentioned that came earlier, from Chimaboy and Giotto all the way up to Tintoretto. You know, like, what else can you do with, figur with, figurative, with figurative painting? There has to be a change in values or a rupture from a cultural upheaval or rupture in order for things to, 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 to change. Otherwise, you're just, you know, it's, it's a real dilemma. There's a real dilemma in the history of painting. And there's a real dilemma for us now, because what are we to do? It can be a reactionary and uh, try to revive the historical methods and 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 feel that you are attempting to really connect and and have a tactile and immediate connection to the past and try to really live a connection with that and let that let what you do be something from actually from the past you might know someone who's trying to do that or you can you, you can to something else you can go along with modernity or I don't know what what is there for painting to do now you know there are some great contemporary painters who I really love and not all of them are figurative I like a lot of abstract painting I like a lot of the stuff that came out in the post-war era I like the zero movement people like Heinz Mack I love spatialism, which is essentially a one-man movement with Lucio Fontana in the 1940s. These are paintings that take you to a different dimension entirely. So there are lots of worthwhile and fantastic things that painting can do that no other medium can never do. I mean, just look at just look at Anselm Kiefer's paintings, take you into a visceral landscape of destruction unlike any other kind of art form. But the old masters, the old masters is where everything was done to the highest level and where, which, and, and, and to such a level that no subsequent generation could ever match or hope to. And academic drawing, academic art, the academic approach to art is completely removed from 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 historical drawing and historical art it's they draw in a fundamentally different way and for a fundamentally different set of reasons the purpose and motive behind the drawing is different 
and the style is very, 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 very different. You can immediately distinguish a, an authentic old master painting from an atelier painting or, a, or an academy painting. So what we ought to do now is move on to the next image, which is the hands. And I'm going to move my thing there. So look at these hands. We did notice a week or so ago, maybe three weeks ago, when we were looking at um, Van Dyck and his Samson and Delilah, how important the hands were, how powerful the hands were at expressing a narrative. We don't only have hands here that are fairly dynamic, dynamically poised. He wouldn't be holding his hands like that for, for a very long time. He's kind of him suggesting movement and a natural movement here in this uh, part of the painting, very uh, early painting, which Rubens did when very young. Three objects we can identify here, a pair of dividers, a pair of brass tipped dividers, may have had steel blades, steel feet. Um, I've got a pair, rather similar pair, maybe it's, maybe it's the same, same from the same set. Um, yeah, pretty similar there. That's a pair of dividers with the brass upper part. You can pick these up actually if you go to if you're at if you, maybe not in London unless you go to a flea market or an antiques market or an antiques fair. If you know any antiques dealers, they probably tell you where to get a pair like this. Uh, yeah, or if you're outside of London, if you go to like a um, an antiques shop, they'll you may find some drafting draftsmen's um boxes which often have a pair of brass topped dividers it's also got a square rule there and also a timepiece beautiful timepiece this is the age of luxury isn't it remember antwerp is a place of commerce of banking of trade and where the burg class are able to indulge in various luxury products including luxury clothes made of very expensive fabrics, jewellery and technology. We are on the cusp of the age of enlightenment. We are in the age of the scientific revolution where the arts and sciences are developing new forms of transportable wealth, essentially. That's the way it's thought of transportable wealth where you can actually buy an individual item to carry on your person which is a, a luxury item that's something that's new that didn't really exist in the middle ages it did exist to a far lesser extent in the renaissance but a pocket watch like that you know a timepiece like that this is a new time this is not the renaissance anymore so we're still introducing uh, Rubens, aren't we? This has been a very long introduction. Um, but let me just tell you a little bit about him and where he was born and a little bit about his background before you get so bored that you just leave and uh, go and do something else. <laughs> I really hope that these workshops are a time where all of you feel like you can really do something that you want to do and that these two hours give you a, a chance to really give you a connection to the history of art that you really want um, and uh, I really hope that the way that I present them enables that to happen rather than I, I don't want it ever to feel like it's a uh, we're um, loving it Jonathan okay good Rian. thank you very much I don't want it to feel like a lecture you know I want it to feel like a, an experience like a transportive experience where there is a history there you know you're doing some history but it's kind of like another world. So thank you, Rian. I'm glad you're loving it. And uh, I hope everyone else is as well. So when is Sir Anthony Van Dyke? I just said Sir Anthony Van Dyke. What I meant to say was Sir Peter Paul Rubens. When was Sir Peter Paul Rubens born? He was born on the 28th of June, 1577. I'm reading from my notes. This book will be full by the end of the nine... The, the next two series, won't it? I've got all the notes on Van Dyck in there. And I've got several other of these books full of drawing from history notes. 
So you can tell when I'm drawing from my notes because I'm looking down. Okay, so he's born on the 28th of June, 1577, in Sagan, Sagan, in Westphalia, in Germany. He was the son of a, of a family born in, from Antwerp, okay, son of a family from Antwerp who had left Flanders because of religion. His father, Jan Rubens, was an alderman. An alderman comes from old or wise man. And there are different types of aldermen in early modern Europe. Jan Rubens was also a lawyer, and he was an alderman probably because he was a lawyer. A legal professional is a, is a, is a private professional who will sell his services to clients, to, to, to clients. And as a private uh, professional, he would have been a, an executive, uh, sort of an executive within the municipality of Antwerp before he left Antwerp for Germany because of religion. Basically, uh, Rubens' father had Protestant quite even Calvinistic sympathies or leanings. And even though Protestantism was certainly accepted during the time of the Dutch Revolt, um, which spanned quite a long time during the lifetime of uh, Jan Rubens, the father of Peter Paul Rubens, it would have been... A, it would have been difficult to operate as a professional um, with Calvinistic leanings or sentiment, especially if they were public sentiments that you espoused. And so he uh, lived with his family. He moved with his family and to live with other family members in Germany. Rubens spent the first 11 years of his life in Germany between Sengen and Cologne in Germany. When he returned to Antwerp in 1597 or 87, 1587, yeah. When he returned in, to Antwerp in 1587, uh, because his father had died, um, his mum brought the family back to Antwerp. She wasn't a Protestant. She may have espoused Protestantism while her husband was alive, but she returned to Catholicism um, upon the death of her husband and moved the family back to Antwerp. And Rubens was then educated, given a classical education. Um, he would have learned Latin. He would have learned about classical texts. He would have learned about Virgil. He would have learned about Homer. He would have learned to read religious texts. He was educated. And that has nothing to do with his family background. His father being a member of the burger class, the educated urban elite, uh, it would have been appropriate for him to have followed in that line of profession and he was given a, uh, a, a classical education. So Rubens had his first 11 years between Sagan and Cologne. His mother was called Maria Piperlink, Piperlinks, Piperlinks, okay. And um, when he returned to Antwerp, when they all returned to Antwerp in 1587, um, that was a period of time in which Antwerp had undergone quite a significant cultural um, conflict essentially. So Antwerp had been one of the main centres of the Dutch Revolt, which began in 1566 and culminated in 1648. However, it was only a outpost of the Dutch Revolt in 1579. So during during the, the, the early childhood of Rubens. So when Rubens was a child and he was growing up in Germany, Antwerp had 
been in a capital of the Dutch Revolt, which was uh, the, the the Low Countries and the Netherlands revolting against Catholic rule from Spain. Okay, um, but Antwerp and Flanders, the, the lower provinces or the Low Countries, as they were then called, um, was reassimilated into uh, Habsburg, into the uh, Habsburg's orbit of power. Um, in 1585, so two years prior to uh, um, Rubens's return to Antwerp. And as I mentioned in uh, the series on Van Dyck, it was Alessandro Farnese, the Duke of Ferrara, who, who, who captured, recaptured Antwerp. So Antwerp was a very, very mixed environment, a very complex environment with aristocracy from across Europe. They also had uh, a Flemish aristocracy, but there was also a mercantile elite and the structure of Flemish society had changed because of new ways of accruing wealth. When there are new ways of accruing wealth, society changes because it changes the balance of power between different people of different statuses. So when you can make a lot of money through trade in cloth, when aristocrats are banned from trade, that means that a mercantile elite can emerge as, as, as politically formidable because um, financial power, wealth, tends to have a concomitant relationship with political influence, doesn't it? So when there are new ways of making money, um, change in society in Antwerp was uh, subject to, to that sort of change, owing to economic uh, influences and international trade. You had a lot of Genoese bankers and aristocrats and traders in, in Antwerp. You had a lot of Dutch traders in Antwerp and the Dutch East India Company was an incredibly wealthy and important institution setting up the early colonies in, in Africa and in the New World. And you also had a lot of, uh, you would have had people from across Europe, Portuguese and German in Antwerp at that time. So it's very, very mixed and interesting place culturally, artistically and economically. So his training, his artistic training, begins under Tobias Verhecht, who specialised in landscapes. He then is then trained by Adam van Nutt, a figurative painter. And this early training happens between 1590 and 1594. But from 1594 or so onwards, he's trained by Otto van Veen. And van Veen was one of the leading painters in Antwerp in the 1590s and early 17th century. And uh, he was a genre painter. He was a painter who mixed his classical learning with a very, very mannerist influenced approach to genre painting. And so that would have had a big impact on, on, on the young Rubens and would have really, really shaped how he would go on to mix all of the different influences that he found in his work. So it's very important. Um, the young Peter Paul Rubens was recognized as a professional artist capable of running his own uh, practice as a painter privately by the Painters Guild of St. Luke in Antwerp in 1598. And as was common at the time, the young Rubens remained as an assistant to Van Veen until 1600. In 1600, Rubens decides to follow in the footsteps of Otto Van Veen and go on a tour of Italy. And that would have been amazing. And that, in fact, that was amazing. We have evidence for how amazing it would have been because there are lots of drawings 
he would have visited the Casa Buonarroti and seen Michelangelo's drawings in the family archives in Florence. He would have seen Michelangelo and Leonardo drawings in display publicly in Florence. He would have seen, oh God, he would have been to the, in the Vatican and he would have, he, he would have spent time drawing the Lauka one. You know, I've drawn the Apollo Belvedere, not the Apollo Belvedere, the Belvedere torso. The Apollo Belvedere is there as well, but I've drawn the Belvedere torso in the Vatican, just there, you know, right in front of it. And that was like as, about as close to a religious experience as I could ever hope to have. Um, and, and uh, but can you even just imagine what it would have been like to, in 1600, uh, just having you know left your 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 hometown and having been trained and recognized as a professional artist and to have really you know to have been encouraged to go and travel and then to be there drawing in the uh in in the vatican having you know such being at such close proximity to the to the laoka one the laoka one was one of the most important classical sculptures ever discovered in the Renaissance, it was discovered in 1506, just in the in a suburb of Rome, and um, it, when it was unearthed, um, it caused an absolute, um, an absolute, uh, it, it aroused a tsunami of interest because of how how legendary it was. People knew about the Lauka one, been written, written about in Pliny's Natural History, um, and people speculated about there possibly being one that was going to be discovered at some point unearthed in 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 or around rome and it it was it was unearthed in in the early 16th century and uh rubens went and drew that sculpture which was on display in the vatican and still is and um it's very 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 much worth taking a flight to rome for and paying to enter the vatican to go and see it and sketch it. And it's also worth going in there to see the Belvedere torso, which, um, which Rubens would have done in Rome. So we've done a bit about his training. Okay. And uh, yeah, I've actually mentioned a lot of the things that are on my notes already. His Latin educate his education in classics and Latin would have given him an understanding and uh, the ability to use the Latin language, which was during the early modern period, the lingua franca of the educated classes of Europe, which would have, which would give, which would have given him a level, a, an extent of access to certain conversations that would have been excluded to non-educated people, even in elite circles. So he would have been of the sort of higher educated elite and um, his literary education and his uh, exposure to classical art in Italy and contemporary art in Italy um, would have helped him to, to, to bind all of his different interests together into his, his, his own approach to painting. So really, really, um, his, his background and his education is very, very important. When you, when you look at his paintings that are genre paintings, obviously we've only looked at a portrait so far. We're going to look at a genre painting in a few moments. We're going to finish with this one and look at a, look at a genre painting in a few moments. When you see the genre paintings, you will really appreciate the importance of the literary education. OK, so maybe you ought to take a break here. I haven't checked the time yet and it is already eight o'clock. So let's take a short break now. I'm going to stop the recording and give everyone a chance to um, to show some work if they want. OK, so let me just pause it there. There we go. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone, for sharing uh, your work. That was really, really good. I really loved what Wilson said, actually, about you can see that in this painting, there's something very, very 16th century in it. And I suppose that was because when Rubens was training, he would have seen a lot of prints of German work. 
and uh, Holbein, he would have had access to a lot of images of Holbein. And in the art education of the 17th century, it was widely recommended that um, not only that not only should the apprentice study drawings of their master, but a wide range of printed material. So prints of Raphael drawings, lots of Raphael paintings and drawings were turned into engravings and disseminated across Europe. Albrecht Dürer, his work would have had a really big and long lasting legacy on the develop and, and shape the, the development of painting uh, thereafter. So very, very import important. So now that we've had a short break, I think it's a good time to look at something different. And this type of painting is what is going to really dominate in the two weeks to come. Can any, anyone tell me, okay, so I spoke about the types of painting that there, that, 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 that there were, it's, you know, what kind of painting is this? What kind of category of, of painting does this painting fall under? Genre, is it? Yeah, that's Pauline, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, Pauline, yeah, absolutely right. It's a genre painting. Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Pauline. Are you having fun tonight, Pauline? Yes, thank you. Good. I like Rubens. Yeah? Have you been waiting a long time for me to do a workshop <laughs> on it? Yes. I like the way he deals with flesh. He deals with it in a way we might call... Rubenesque, eh? Yes, yeah. So funny, that coincidence. So, um, yeah, Rubens is brilliant. And uh, this is uh, one of his, one of his early paintings, an early genre painting. It's of a subject um, from classical Greek antiquity. Um, it's from Homer, it's from Homer's Iliad. The man in the foreground who is uh, has his back to us is uh, is Paris. Paris is handing a golden apple to Venus, and Paris is is one of the princes of Troy, written about in in Homer's Iliad. He's the brother of the great and you know warrior of Troy, Hector, and Paris. Is the one who essentially brings war to, to Troy from the Achaeans because of something that's happening right here. And uh, I'll tell the story, well, summarize the story, but talk, uh, and also talk about the, the painting. So with, with this subject, the judgment of Paris. It's not it's not Paris being judged. It's Paris doing the the judging, and he's basically judging Venus as he's basically proclaiming Venus as the most beautiful of these three goddesses. So that's what's happening now. Uh, this is a scene. The judgment of Paris is a scene that was quite common, quite popular in the 17th century among patrons of art in Europe. And it was not only popular with painters and patrons, but also it's, it's a painting that Rubens depicted a, a number of times. There's another early, slightly later version of this, not a version of this painting, but another interpretation of the Judgment of Paris, a different composition by Rubens in the Prado in Madrid. And we'll look at that next week. And uh, so we'll see an evolution in his approach, even when, he, even when dealing with one and the same narrative. So we've got Cupid, as well there, Cupid is clinging on to Venus and we've got some cherubim, some putty up in the clouds there. And one of them is crowning Venus while Paris is giving her a golden apple. Mercury is there behind, behind Paris. We have a river god and uh, a nymph 
with the river god there looking in and i suppose the spectators of the scene of the satyrs in the trees in the background and the river god and the nymph in the in, slightly behind the goddesses it you know these spectators join us don't they this is what genre painting has the capacity to do not only to tell a narrative but to have a, a a dynamic relationship with the with the viewer as a spectator of the narrative because we're engaging with different parts of the composition at different levels and that's something that distinguishes genre painting from portraiture or landscape now genre painting will comprise elements of portraiture of landscape of still life but it will do so in a complex composition which conveys a story a history or a mythology or a religious story it's a scene it's like a dramatic scene it's a, yeah it, it, that's what it is that's what genre painting is and it's traditionally considered the high of the highest rank in in, in painting okay so we've got here the judgment of paris it's painted around 1597 or 50, you know between there and 1599 possibly even as late as 1600 this painting was either painted in the years leading up to Rubens's departure for Rome or soon upon Rubens's arrival in Rome. Okay, so he's either in Antwerp or in Rome here. So similar to our, uh, uh, if we think cast our minds back to, to, to the previous series where we we're looking at Sir Anthony van Dyck, we had that wonderful self-portrait from around 1620 when Van Dyck was either in, in Antwerp or, or was in, in, in London. He may have painted that self-portrait in London, that self-portrait which is hung in the Met in New York, may have been painted during uh, his brief, brief four-month visit to London when he got to see the Arundel collection and uh, was introduced to the court of James I. So here we've got a, uh, a depiction of Paris. He's the Prince of Troy there on the left. We can see his, what we can see is bum. And so some of my originals will really like that. Okay, so this is for you. And uh, and there'll be a there'll be a slightly different image what i'll do actually actually in is is i'm going to speak for a couple more minutes and then i'll move on to the next slide and this is the next slide okay so better view of the figures so maybe be more general and expansive in the drawing first before we home in on those central figures okay in that foreground band of, of figures that we have okay so he's he is the prince of of troy but he doesn't know it he's actually been raised as a uh, as a as a shepherd boy and this is unique to a, a latinized version of the homeric tale okay the homeric tale relating to homer the great poet of greek antiquity poet probably of the greek dark ages which the, the greek dark ages followed the mycenaean period and it's that intermediary a, uh, age between the collapse of mycenaean greece and archaic and geometric Greece. It's a dark age in ancient Greek history, um, which comes before the archaic period. And, and the archaic period is where we think that the first copies of Homer's epic were actually transcribed. They were preserved orally through the, 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 the Greek dark ages. So Homer, poet of dark age Greece or, or archaic Greece, it's the foundation or the, the, the first author alongside Hesiod. We don't know their dates exactly. It's very hard to know. Um, 
but they these two are these two writers these two poets they're poets they're not writers they're poets these two poets are the are the uh the earliest um foundation of uh, Western literary consciousness that we that we have, and uh, in the Romanized uh, telling of Homer's great epic, the the Iliad, um, I mean it's a story that is told in many different versions. There are lots of versions of of, of these of the mythologies, and that's something that we have to uh, appreciate is that with stories like um, Ariadne. You know, she helps uh, Theseus escape from the Minotaur, but that story is told in different versions. So all these uh, classical myth stories are told in different ways, in different versions at different times by different writers. And so in the Roman, one Roman version, Paris is raised as a, as a shepherd. OK, so um, what we have, you know, what we have here, him doing here, what we see him doing here is handing Venus a golden apple beside uh venus to her right is juno look how angry juno looks she's looking at paris and frowning and minerva to venus's left is turning her back so we've got this uh, classical uh, greek romanized greek uh, goddesses what we're going to do now is, is is move ahead to a closer image OK, there we go. All right. This is a fantastic slide. So uh, we have Venus in the middle. She's taking that golden apple from from Paris. And um, we have these three figures from Greek and Roman mythology. But there's not only a literary stimulus for how he paint these figures. Does this composition and do the figures there remind you of anything? One with the back turned and two facing us, female nudes like this. It's very Grecian, it's very Roman, it's very Hellenic. Three nude women. Graces. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, yeah the three graces. So, yeah. you know, he would have seen images of the three graces. Uh, he would have seen engravings of Raphael designs of the three graces. Um, and there would have been sculptures, models and casts of the three graces in Flanders during the time in which Rubens was educated or being educated in painting. So he has, he would have had access and it was also given his classical education. So this is a, a, a glimpse of that dynamic eclecticism that I am talking about in this series on Van Dyke. On, on, <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to be doing it in weeks to come. You know, I'm going to be saying Van Dyke instead of Rubens. I'm sorry. This is something that really does characterize Rubens is eclectic use of various different sources. You know, and here this is so interdisciplinary because it's the classical narrative, it's classical erudition, it's understanding the texts that are at the very foundation of Western thought and Western memory and Western culture. These are the stories and the ideas that have shaped our world and who we are and the value and meaning that we perceive in everything that we read, watch, see and hear. Okay, we wouldn't understand the world the way we do if it wasn't for Homer, because he's part of that, he's such a central part of that development. And that's something that Rubens is interacting with. Okay, so Rubens is actually drawing upon a familiar pool of ideas, which intuitively resonate with us, because it's so deeply implanted in our consciousness already. So if me or you look at anything which is related to Homer, while we might not be able to just tell you what the narrative is, if we're taken by surprise or we don't know that that is a depiction of, I don't know, Achilles being, you know, you know, being killed or something, or Ajax mourning, lamenting the death of Achilles. These are both 
elements that exist within the Homeric narrative. While we might not be able to identify that that's exactly what it is, it would intuitively resonate with us because it's part of the literary tradition that has shaped how we see. The reason Shakespeare resonates so much with us is because it draws upon so much classical, so many classical ideas, but they have also shaped the way we perceive all of the literary and dramatic arts. And that's the power of culture. And that's what Rubens is using here, is using the power of culture to, to, to create something that is immediately meaningful. Because it's already in us, this story. But he's doing it in a way which blends aesthetically with pre-existing models of sculpture. The Free Graces, which have come to him via the sculptures themselves and via Raphael. The movement in the figures, you know, the, the, the actual real sense of movement in the figures, that turn, you know, running the tension running through Venus's torso as she turns her shoulder to move her right arm forward to grasp the apple. That is derived from Renaissance design, showing the action and movement in the pose, absolutely central to Renaissance drawing. So, and Michelangelo. So very, very, very foundational Renaissance developments permeating through into Rubens's depiction of the free graces here. And his back, the musculature in his back, it's more, it's more visceral and the, the anatomy is depicted with a greater sense of is deeper modeling and also a sense of compression. There's a degree of realism, which isn't really a characteristic of Renaissance painting. Renaissance painting is naturalistic as opposed to realistic to a very, very great degree. And also generally speaking. But here we can see an actual, you know, with, with, with Titian you get this actually, when a seat nude is seated on something, you get the, the compression in the buttocks because of the weight of the body showing the compression in, you know, pushing the buttocks down onto the, to the surface. And you can see that compression and tension in his buttocks. And that's, that is a superficial detail that isn't really seen in Michelangelo's painting or paintings or Leonardo's paintings but is seen in Venetian paintings like like with uh, you have that wonderful Venus and Adonis and Venus is sitting on the sitting on something and she's trying to get Adonis not to go hunting because she knows he's going to get killed and her buttocks are really pressing against what she's sitting on and it's that deliberate it's that deliberate um display of the compression of flesh that makes the painting more sensual. That's what Rubens is doing there. And he's showing how he can paint both female and male nude um, at this early age. That's one of the things that he's deliberately doing. The pose of the female nude on the right really reminds me of a, a, a design by Bronzino, one of the other Mannerist painters who was a student of Pontormo. And I suspect that he, you know, he certainly was aware of Bronzino because he was such an important Mannerist painter in Florence. And I suspect that there is a connection to one of, uh, the there, are, there are connections to various different visual sources for these things. And I think that Rubens can really give all of us a lesson in being an artist because he would find images and find inspiration in various different things, you know, that I've mentioned and listed already. Um, and make them work for him. It's not 
it's not uh that's the way creativity works and it's the way that you can unlock your own vision is by drawing from what leaves an impression in your imagination and lifting that impression into your own work and channeling that into something your own and that's how art, art has always been and i think that is the, really one of the chief attributes of creativity itself So he's got classical antiquity, our literary heritage, mixed with the whole development of Renaissance, lots of the different aspects of the development of, of painting in the Renaissance from perspective to figurative anatomy and proportion to showing the visceral sensuality of flesh. It's very unresolved for Rubens as he would mature, his figures would be far more convincing. But this is extraordinary for an artist of his age. It's extraordinarily accomplished, sophisticated for an artist of his age, bearing in mind he's about, if he was born in 1577, he's about 20, 22. He's in his early 20s. Okay, and if you painted this, um, in uh, in 1597, if he was 1597, he was, you know, 20 years old, a very, very early painting, very, very young guy. So why, why is, um, why is Paris handing a golden apple to Venus? She's a god, he thinks he's just a, a, a shepherd. Um, basically, what happens is the gods appear to, to, to Paris, and he's charged with judging Paris, Juno, and Minerva, uh, judging them in a kind of uh, beauty contest, which is, sounds very cheap, <laughs> um, sort of weird. And uh, but yeah, that's that's this Roman version of the story. And uh, they each promise him something different. But what convinces him? Okay, so they each say, "I'll do this for you if you." choose me what venus says is if you choose me and give me the golden apple and thereby signify that i am the most beautiful then you will you will win the love of the most beautiful mortal woman uh, she happens to be helen and she's married to king menelaus menelaus of Sparta, and uh, that is what he goes for, and so he chooses, chooses Venus. Mercury standing beside him, looking on, and Minerva has her back to us while Juno looks furiously down at, you know, really quite uh, livid with uh, with Paris there. Quite a remarkable, quite a remarkable painting with lots of beautiful narrative there. And there's a beautiful dog in the foreground as well. We all love dogs, you see. People in the early modern period love dogs. Still life as well. We've got some armor there. Minerva's left, you know, let her armor sit down there on the floor. Cupid is there winged, clinging on to Venus's thigh. He's got his little quiver of arrows there strapped around his shoulder. Excellent. This painting's in the National Gallery in London. If you're ever in London, you should definitely go and see it. If you're from London, you should you probably see it quite often. Some permanent display in there. How about the technique? Um, this is painted on a wooden panel, I believe. The previous one, it looks to me like it's painted on panel. Previous image, the previous painting, that portrait of the young man, the uh, geographer or architect, painted on copper, painted on a metal panel. This is painted on wood. And um, it was qu quite unusual for artists to 
not unusual, but it was becoming less common for us to paint on wood in the 17th century. Canvas had proven itself to be a reliable replacement for panel. And um, this is huge, okay? So this painting, if you bear with me one moment, perhaps I'll be able to just um, find that out for you. Actually, maybe it's in this book I've got, actually. I might be able to find out how big it is. It is big. The figures are not life-size, but it isn't a small painting. It's on a wooden panel. Maybe it's not in this book, actually. Previous one wasn't in this book either. I need to buy some more books on Rubens. He's never been an artist that has really... <laughs> I've really been really, really, I've always admired him for his brilliance, but he's never been an artist that I have particularly been um, fascinated by. Well, he is, I do acknowledge that he is excellent. So we have here the judgment of Paris. This painting is, yeah, so it's, about it's it's almost two meters across and it's a, almost a meter and a half from bottom to top so two meters that way one and a half meters that way so quite big anything that's coming up to two meters in any direction is 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 a large scale work <laughs> that's okay and um uh yeah, so the, the figures are not quite, uh, not quite, they're, they're significantly smaller than life size. This is a great exercise for a young painter. I want to check how long we've got. Okay, everyone, so we're going to go on for a little while longer. I'm going to leave plenty of time for everyone to show their work. And um, what I'll do before we finish up is talk a little bit, a bit about technique. So the painting is large. And technique wise, look at the transparency of the paint. This is something that what Van Dyck, what Van Dyck, I keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. What Rubens really starts to develop is, a, is an approach to painting, which is quite quick. He likes to execute paintings very quickly and he learns to execute paintings very quickly. And there is a necessity behind that. And that is because he ends up being always on the move. He ends up being so highly sought after. And he has to, A, employ lots of people to assist. And he also has to learn how to finish important aspects of a painting very quickly so that he can then move on to the next piece. So he's a very, very prolific artist. He paints this, he paints this, this one topic about six times in his entire life. So this one topic can be painted several times by, by, by Rubens. Because it's a popular subject. And so he has to paint it for a range of, for, for various different patrons at different times in his life. So the technique is quite rapid. The approach, the application is quite rapid. And you can see the layers under here. You can see that the panel is gesso prepared prepared with gesso at first and then an imprimatura you can see that there's a dark earthy tone sealing the gesso ground and then there's a grisal you can see the you see here if you look at her buttocks there you can see that in the shadows below the buttocks and here at the edge of the thigh there and at her left elbow here, and on the edges of Venus as well, you can see that the brown mid-tone, which is the same as the ground layer here. It's because when old masters are painting, I'll do a course on paint, painting one day, um, and teach people about the traditional or historical old master approach to painting, which is very different to all other approaches to painting. And, um, 
you can see how the, the underpainting is visible or the ground layer is visible on, in these areas of shadow. So the actual ground layer is serving as a mid-tone and also allowing Rubens to focus on modeling the lighter areas while, while not having to focus too much on the shadows in the subsequent layers of the painting. So the mid-tone will provide that base shadow in the figures, as well as sealing the, the painting and providing a ground, a mid-tone ground. You see that in Giorgione. Giorgione was an artist who made great use of the ground and would leave areas of the, of the underpainting ground layer visible where he hadn't modeled the lights over it. There were, you know, areas of a Giorgione painting where you can look, see straight into the ground. It makes the painting so magical when you can see the ground layer. Not something you see much in a highly, in, a, in, a, in fine painting. In fine painting, if you look at Gerd Dow, who was one of the uh, fine painters, a student of Rembrandt, but one of the, um, the fine painters who would, you know, instead of painting roughly and leaving areas of the ground visible, he would paint over everything. If you look at Holbein's paintings as well, from the 1530s, you can see that, you know, the whole painting, the no, under, no area of the underpainting is visible. It's all, all modeled up. But here, this is a more economic approach, allowing the underpainting to, to provide some of the shadows still. And that's something that he would have learned from his training, something that artists were doing increasingly more often during the 17th century. And it does, it really does provide something of that old master aesthetic and look. Uh, you don't see much of that today. And the underpainting showing through. A lot of the uh, uh, approaches to painting today is uh, very a la prima, including in the Russian academies and in the American academies and ateliers and in the European ateliers of academic art. The painting approach is largely a la prima. They don't use the sort of layered approach that it was really fundamental to how the old masters painted. And it's partly because of the quality of the materials and you know, in what resins to use and what mediums to use and how to, the materials have evolved to something else after, you know, because everything is so industrial now. Pigments, the paints, the oils are not the same. It's, you can't really use modern paint quite like this. I think I mentioned that during the Van Dyke sessions a couple of weeks ago. But um, people do pretty well with what they've got and that's really good. I think that we're going not. Well, I think we're going to leave it there, and uh, we'll, I really want to have a look at some of your drawings and then have dinner. So, thank you very much, everyone. I really hope you've enjoyed our introductory session on Rubens, and that you've you're you're thirsty for more. Next week and the week after, we're going to talk a little bit more about his artistic education and training, and then we're going to travel with Rubens to Rome, where he goes as a young man and draws from a wide range of different things. So make sure you join me next week. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed Drawing From History today. And I hope that you got a lot out of hearing about Rubens. They had a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, you, uh, you're always welcome at Drawing From History. I really hope you had a fun, fun session. Tag the Renaissance Workshop in your drawings if you post them on Instagram. And uh, if you know someone who you think might enjoy taking part, share the YouTube video with them or direct them to the website where they can sign up to get the link every week for the Drawing From History Workshop live on Zoom. Okay, thank you very much. Thank and you, John. Thank that's you. okay. Oh, you're very welcome. So I hope you will enjoy 